The topic tonight for uh, Brother Gene's sermon is the Word of God written for our learning. And his text is uh, Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. This section of the letter addresses the mature believer's regard of the incomplete understanding of a mature believer. Paul quotes a text here from Psalm 69 concerning Jesus' regard for God's will and his yielding to it. Jesus' example here by taking our sin on him and laying down his life spurs us on to selflessness. He uses this to provoke the mature to patience and give them comfort as they deal with those not yet mature. The mature learn this since they are part of the means by which God matures other believers. They have a godly perspective of those after them in the process of growing in grace and knowledge. And scripture is that primary instrument in helping them to grow uh, for uh, either um, mature or immature, either one. Mm -hmm. Psalms 119 verse 130 says, The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. <coughs> Paul at the end of his life stated an even higher view to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, and knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Hebrews gives us a warning that says we must give the most earnest heed to the things we have learned, yes, lest we drift away. So if we don't hold on to these things, the word in high regard, in our hearts and minds, we will not continue to grow in our faith, and we won't be able to hold out this word of life to others as well. So. I greatly treasure these statements of the apostles in their writings about the things that have been written beforehand. Things that have been written in the past. Because by, by those kinds of statements, of course they give us understanding of what has been written. They open up what has been written before that, that was uh, not clear. Simply because the greater light hadn't yet come. Enlightenment had not yet come when those things were written before. Peter refers to that, of course, when he says they, in, they searched intently to know and understand. And it was told to them that they, they spoke not for themselves, but for us. So, it's appropriate that then by these writings of the apostles and the prophets in the Spirit, that we would have more light that they would be able to give us more light, having been enlightened themselves, and then they were entrusted with delivering more light, leading into more light by what they said, so to speak. Ultimately, of course, it's a great shepherd of the sheep who does the leading, but he has chosen to lead in this manner and to have under shepherds who provide in this leading as well. I wanted to note to you as I begin that our brother uh, Nave, Naves <laughs> cites 49 quotes or allusions just in the book of Romans to the writings of the prophets and the Psalms and Moses. 49 direct quotes or allusions. I take this text here to be an allusion. I'm not clear on the precise definition of that word allusion but it's, it's pointing to it you know pointing to these things that were written aforetime written before Paul's readers knew what he was referring to when he said that he quotes this text from Psalm 69 and makes the application to them about this circumstance and this experience of dealing with one another in this tug of war about issues over which they didn't agree. Issues over which one would criticize another. 
And he's challenging those who are more mature uh, to have an attitude of patience as they dealt with those who had not yet learned the truth, the larger perspective of these things. And he used this text to comfort them. You know, the, the believers would hear this quote and think, oh, the years that Jesus sat in the synagogues and heard others teach, the things that he had to endure, <laughs> things that they didn't understand, and he sat there at the age of 14, at the age of 17, at the age of 20, increasing all the time, increasing all the time, at the age of 23, at the age of 27, and hearing others teach. Now, perhaps he got the opportunity from time to time, but, but uh, it was not yet time for him to have his full ministry. So the things that he endured, and so the apostle then is urging these believers to endure with one another in this manner and develop then patience and draw comfort from the scriptures while they were being patient with one another. Now, the things written before, whatsoever, for whatever things were written before, written aforetime, time, ahead of this time, that the, I, I really think that the Apostle Paul, my own view is the Apostle Paul knew he was writing Scripture. He knew he was writing things that had been delivered to him by the Holy Spirit to be delivered to the church. He understood this. It was part of his commission, wasn't it? It was part of his commission, part of his office, and the work of his office was to deliver these things. And so as he wrote these things, whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The things written before, that is revealed things, things that were revealed of God's purpose, God's wisdom, God's effect, uh, affection, the things that God hated, the things that God despised, the things that, that he rejected, all of these things, revealed things, what he counseled in himself and kept hidden then. He says that in this letter, Paul does. God kept these things hidden until the right time. Now they've been revealed, he says. This mystery, as he says in Ephesians, this mystery has been revealed, but God kept it for a time. We've been, we've been giving special focus and attention for some months now in, in our Friday evening meeting on Abraham and Isaac. We're in the midst of focusing on Jacob and Esau, the things that were revealed. Our brother delivered to us a couple of years ago a series of messages about Joseph, mm -hmm. the things that were revealed in him, see? The manner of his working in the earth. Through Job. Uh, through Moses at the age of 40. Who thought that, see, Moses thought that his people would see, but they didn't. Yeah. Now, Stephen says this. No one contradicted Stephen when he said that. And his audience was not, was, was not a sympathetic audience, was it? <laughs> so if he'd said something out of line, yeah. well, when he did say something out of line, they attacked him, didn't they? Yeah. They stopped him right there. Yeah. So Moses thought this, but it wasn't time yet, was it? And then a generation later, what we call a generation, at age 80, God said, now is the time. I've heard the call of my people. The cries of my people have come up to me. And I've come down to deliver them. Therefore, you go. You go. See, it was time. So God was, pardon me, revealing the manner of his working in the earth. Our brother David, anointed king as a boy. When there was a man on the throne, a powerful man, a man who was regarded and respected even by the enemies of Israel. He'd done great damage to the enemies of Israel. And from the time of his, uh, the first event, for the first opportunity for Saul to lead his people there in Israel, the people acclaimed him. And said, there, there, there were some who had spoken against Saul and said, bring those people out here and we'll kill them. 
So Saul was highly regarded, and yet God appointed this young man. Likely mid-late teen years. Old enough to be entrusted with the care of the flocks of his father. Then for a period of years, uh, David was pursued by Saul. Despite David's regard for him, despite the fact that David had at least two opportunities to assassinate him and did not, and many would have said, well, it's completely understandable that he would do it, but see, God was revealing something. God was showing something of his purpose and his manner of working in the earth to show that, of course, the, Paul states it this way. We're all familiar with the text that God's foolishness is wiser yeah. and his weakness is stronger Amen. than that of men. Job says it this way. I think some months ago, some weeks ago, uh, I cited this text from Job chapter 12. Wonderful words. With him are strength and prudence. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away plundered, makes fools of the judges. Loosens the bonds of kings, binds their waist with a belt, leads princes away plundered, overthrows the mighty, deprives the trusted ones of speech, and takes away the discernment of the elders, pours contempt on princes, disarms the mighty, uncovers deep things out of darkness, brings the shadow of death to light. He makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and guides them. He takes away the understanding of the chiefs of the people of the earth and makes them wander in a pathless wilderness. They grope in the dark without light and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. Now this is the way God deals with powerful people. See? Showing himself, his manner. And there he raised up Pharaoh, didn't he? Pharaoh number three. This is the Pharaoh that Moses dealt with, the second Pharaoh that he dealt with, not, his, not the one who was his stepfather, grandfather, stepfather, stepgrandfather. God anointed and removed Saul. And then, of course, ultimately he sent the master. He sent his own dear son to lay down his life and take it up again. In summation of this thinking here about God's manner and the revealed things, the prophet Jeremiah says this, Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so that I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? So there are revealed things. And, and of those things, they're just selected. So there are many things that are not revealed. And even of the revealed things, God selects just certain things because he has a focus. He has a focus. Now David states it this way. This is God's focus, I think. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgment are a great deep, O Lord. You preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust in the shadow of your wings. Mercy, faithfulness, righteousness, judgment, loving kindness. See? It's a focus of what God is revealing. And it's, no, it's about himself. His nature, his character, if you will. With him are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding, Job said. So God focuses on certain things, and those things he focuses on are of his own nature, aspects of himself. He wants us to see those things, and then also he neglects certain things. He doesn't tell us certain things. You think, you think our brother in our Friday night lesson has noted for us again and again and again the, the, uh, just in Abraham's life, the years that went by. And we don't know anything about what happened. Because this is not just a record about Abraham's life, see. This is a record of God dealing with Abraham and of Abraham yielding himself to God's will and purpose. It's not just to tell us all the things we'd like to know 
about Abraham and Sarah and all the others that were associated with them. It's, that's not the point of it at all, like how men write <coughs> biographies and give us all kinds of little details and so forth and so on, if they can. If they can, of course, we know sometimes they just make it up as they go along. <laughs> it makes a good story, you know, you've got to keep people's attention. God doesn't do things like that. And of course, God is revealing, revealing to us, as I mentioned earlier, the things that he hates. Let me read you a text here from Jeremiah. Three different statements that God makes. They built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. They have also built the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, nor did it come into my mind. See? They built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination. Amen. See, now this is God revealing how he thinks about such things. Now, Israel knew this. These were the kinds of things that the Canaanites had done. All seven of those nations had done things like this, and now they had fallen into these same things. They'd done it during the period of Judges. They were severely reprimanded, and now here they are hundreds of years later. They're still doing it. And God hates it. Things written before. We have a record. In fact, two-thirds of the scripture record is about such things. And God, God's view of such things. Things written before. For our learning and knowledge, information, the record of the lives of the great cloud of witnesses whose faith endured these times of twilight and moonlight. Remember, we, we can all remember times when we didn't know things about the Lord. Didn't understand his ways, even to the extent that we do now. How difficult it was because we had a desire, we had a hunger. We were drawn to these things. Years and years reading the scripture, trying to, trying to uh, sort them out, so to speak. Trying to rightly divide them. And these good brethren didn't have what we have. Didn't have what we had at all. They had twilight and moonlight compared to the sunrise from on high <laughs> that we have. We have insight, the Spirit revealing these things. Here's what the Apostle Paul said there in Hebrews. You're familiar with these words. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had been called, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return, but now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God's not ashamed to be called their God. He has prepared a city for them. Amen. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which also he received him, in a figurative sense. So the Holy Spirit highlights these kinds of things, chosen things, particular things, specific things, yes. to teach these things to us. Moses By faith, Moses. Now, these are the words before. This is, this is a record of Moses before he stood on Sinai. Before God placed him in the cleft of the rock and passed by him and declared his name. This is, this is Moses' perspective. You're familiar with it. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming, esteeming the reproach of Christ. That's the Holy Spirit's. That's heaven's perspective of Moses' perspective. Amen. That's how heaven interpreted these things, see. 
that this was Moses' insight, even with the limited light, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater of greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward by faith. He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. By faith he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So they had insight. They had understanding. This is what they learned, see, for our learning. This is what they learned. We learn. Connected truth, that is, they're able to take these things that are revealed and, and make a connection yeah. down through the generations. Rightly divide these things. Rightly emphasize and focus and hold up the things that are primary. Not, not forgetting other aspects of the truth, but there are certain aspects of the truth that are primary. We live in a generation, that's... You might say that the master's generation did the same thing. Religious people have always done this. Just highlight certain things that they like for one reason or another. This is attractive to me, so we're going to build everything around this. Or this, is, this looks good to me. I'm going to make this a template over which to lay everything. This is going to be the plumb line for us, okay? This is going to be the standard of measure for us, unlike that group over there. See, this is what, this is what people do. But understanding is able to rightly connect this truth or rightly divide this truth. The meaning of past events, what the Holy Spirit spoke of God's purpose and his working and will to execute it. This is what, the, this is what our brother's doing here in this letter in Romans, which is preeminent. Surely it's preeminent of all of his letters. Or in Hebrews that I've just read some sections from. For the, from a Jewish perspective, it's preeminent from their perspective, making these connections of these things that have been revealed. And Moses and Joshua and all of those experiences and the things that were revealed in, Le in Leviticus, the things revealed about the priesthood and the temple or the tabernacle and the temple and the, and the sacrifices, all of these things. See, the Holy Spirit guided the brother to, br to draw these things together and to hold up these things. These things are primary. See? Because he understood that, as our brother just mentioned, all of these treasures of wisdom and knowledge are deposited in the sun. Amen. They're all there in the sun, see. So he, for the Apostle Paul, for all of the writers of the New Testament scriptures, he was the plumb line. <laughs> he was the cornerstone. He himself, not religious practice, not religious methodology or systems. This man, seated at the right hand of God, this one who, as the Lamb of God at the center of the throne, was able to take the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated upon the throne, the only one able to open the seven seals because he had triumphed in the earth. See? Now those things were made known to Brother John But Paul and Peter, they understood those things. They spoke about those things, so to speak, from just a different perspective. They were able to understand the woven works of God in the lives of these chosen witnesses, from, or these witnesses from the past. Pardon me, not the, they were the chosen witnesses, but the witnesses from the past, the great cloud of witnesses that were surrounding them, see. They were able to make these connections. So the Apostle Paul could speak as he did of David and Abraham in Romans. He could speak as he did of Abraham and Isaac in his letter in Galatians. Or of Jacob and Esau, again in Romans, he could speak that way about them and make these connections and highlight these things for his readers that they then would get these connections and understand how this truth is revealed in the lives. This truth about God's righteousness, God's love and affection for righteousness and justice, which are the foundation of his throne, God's affection for these is revealed in the lives of these people. They would then be able to have judgment. 
they'd be able to assess these things for themselves. What's true? And what's not true? We're going to measure these things by ourselves? Well, look at our chaotic society now. The chaos that's in the world because people, as the Apostle Paul says, measure themselves by themselves. See? Amen. Well, make yourself the standard. Yeah. Well, then it is survival of the fittest, isn't it? Yeah. If you make yourself the standard, the smartest guy, the richest guy, the fastest guy, the most powerful guy, the guy who talks the fastest, uh, the guy who has the best uh, illustrations and stories, and the, the, uh, in our generation, the person who looks the best on camera. See? If you measure yourself by yourself, if we're the standard, see? The standard of truth, that is. But we know we're not the standard of truth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who have received a love of the truth, or love for the truth, that is revealed truth, Truth that comes from another place, just like the light comes on the earth from another place. There's no light here of itself. It has to come from another place. Well, this truth comes from another place as well, and God then grants us the power to assess and evaluate, and evaluate this. The, the enemies of the Master and the Apostles, they ignored parts of Scripture. In my lesson the other day, I mentioned that they, they ignored the text there in Hebrews or in Isaiah 11 that talks about a prophet coming out of Galilee. <laughs> they just ignored it and said to Nicodemus, look and see, there's no prophet comes out of Galilee. Well, Isaiah said it was. There was a prophet that comes out of Galilee, see. Now oh, they just threw that off. Yep. They didn't care about that. They'd read it. They knew what it said, but they weren't willing to give it its right focus. And it's right emphasis, see? And so we've all dealt with people like that. And it's likely that we, at some time, were that way. Where our focus and emphasis was, was not properly set and understood. We're able then to see, with this judgment, we're able to see what is lies, what is deception, what is deceptive. God does not let men use his words and thoughts what he has revealed, he doesn't let them use them for their own agendas. They have to twist his word and change it into something that it was not, uh -huh. as our brother said. Take the power from it, and then they can modify it. But it's no longer the word of God when they do that, see? It's just become their religious <coughs> agenda. Their, their religious emphasis for their particular corner of the truth, so to speak. What they think is their corner of the truth. And then you've got those who say, oh, well, we're all, we're all in the ark, you know. We're just all in different compartments. We're all in the ark. I remember hearing, brother, uh, much older than I say that years and years ago. And uh, I was not equipped uh, to deal with it. But it was, uh, oh, my, I was stunned to hear a, a, a man educated in Scripture and had some sincerity and genuineness, some to him, and knowing that closely, personally, and so forth, but, well, we're, we're all just on the ark together, just in different compartments, you know. Now, that's the way people view this. That's the way people view these things. They're not able to assess and evaluate, rightly assess and evaluate these things. They avoid the Word of God. They ignore His intent and elevate their own. But if we learn what God reveals... We're able to assess, rightly assess the truth and rightly divide his word. For our learning that we, that phrase, that we through, that we through, so there's, there's a personal application to us of these things. His purpose in us, of course, is to regenerate us, make us alive again, to give us life from himself because we were dead, <laughs> because we were in darkness, because we were crippled and blind and naked and deaf and dumb. We were dead. <laughs> That's what dead people are, see? They don't get up and walk around. They don't see things. They don't hear things. They don't speak. We were that way. He's given us life. Amen. Renewed us in the image of him who made us. He's transformed us and continues to transform us. We continue to be changed from glory to glory. 
From darkness to light, from death to life, blindness to sight, lameness to strength, deafness to hearing, muteness, or being mute to being able to speak. And God prepared in advance all of these things. He's prepared. He, they, see, that we've just come into them. They were established and ready. And when we come to Christ then, He leads us into these things. He delivers us. God delivers us in His Son, delivers us into these things that He prepared in advance. He equips us. He directs us in fellowship with Himself day by day, often moment by moment. Believers don't have a license to use these things for their own wisdom and interests or appetites. Not so. These things are granted to the people of God to fulfill His purpose through us. To bear fruit for Him. Fruit that will last. Fruit first of all to God, of course. And then for us as well. And then what we have, we can present to others. Just as we do here. Just as we're doing now. At His return, He will have a return. Well, He has a return now, doesn't He? He has a return from us now of his investment. We will personally benefit as well. We're escaping the corruption that's in the world. We're partaking of his divine nature. So we get a, we're getting a personal benefit from it right now. He places us in the body so that then we are helped. We are ministered to. And he works in us to minister to the other parts of the body. We've been talking about this a lot from... The brothers' lessons on Wednesday night, the things our brother Paul wrote to the believers there in Ephesus. We engage all of these things through God's truth and the body then builds itself up in love. For the Father first, for the Son, and then of course for one another as well. Because we're all connected to the Son. And he's bringing all of us to the Father. That through patience and the comforts and the comfort of the scripture, we then have trust to wait and endure through the time that we're here, through all the testing and all the trouble and so forth. And we, and we have the record, we have the record of these who with just twilight and moonlight were able to endure. How much more then, see, how much more then shall we endure? The troubles within, the troubles without. We have the record of Moses' troubles in himself, David's troubles in himself, Joseph's troubles in himself, Daniel's troubles in himself, on and on and on. He provides for us in it patience and the comfort of the scriptures. Daniel and Babylon, for decades, for decades, there in that place. But he had the scriptures, didn't he? And he read that letter that Jeremiah had sent to Babylon, likely decades before. The time was coming near. Daniel was an old man. The time was near. And so he began to pray. And we have this record of his praying. So God provided for him in this. Jeremiah promised in that letter to Babylon, from what we call Jeremiah 23, that the people would return after 70 years. And Daniel could see the time was approaching. Now we don't know where he was at that particular time in that 70 years, but he could see it coming. And he was glad and he was confident of God's provision. That God would keep his word. That God was doing So he had hope, see? And that's the conclusion of these things, isn't it? That we might have hope. Hope for God's kingdom. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, they had hope for God's kingdom. We need not be careful in speaking to you about this, O king. <laughs> for our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. Why? Because they had hope. They knew the things that were written, didn't they? They had a great cloud of witnesses at that point in Revelation. They knew the things that had been inscribed before. They knew the things that David wrote. They knew the things that Asaph wrote. They knew the things that Moses wrote. They knew the things that even Solomon had written. They knew the downfall that Solomon had. Likely they knew more about Solomon than we do. And so they had hope of things unseen. And they did not fear the king's wrath. Just They knew that Moses had not feared the king's wrath. And look what God did through him. So we're not going to fear your wrath either. 
will not do what you say. We will stand. God help us. Now they didn't say that, but that was their perspective, wasn't it? Even as they were tied and cast into the flame and got up off the floor with their hands free and walked around in the fire and had fellowship with a fourth person in the fire. Amen. See? So they had hope in God's kingdom. Our brother Daniel, of course, had hope in God's kingdom as well. He did not fear the king's edict and continued to pray. Yeah. And it's likely his hands didn't have to be tied. It's likely he walked right into the lion's den, likely thinking he would not come out again. He didn't have a promise that he was going to come out, but he had a promise of God's kingdom, didn't he? And God's sovereignty. And at that point in his life, he was not going to waver. He was not going to waver. And the, the people, the person who was afraid was the king, the one who'd made the order. <laughs> he was afraid for Daniel's safety. He was afraid for his own because he wouldn't have Daniel's assistance. He couldn't count on anybody like he could count on Daniel. That man was afraid he couldn't sleep during the night. He couldn't eat during the night. And yet, he had some, some glimmer of hope, didn't he? Where did he get that hope? Huh? And the next morning, he went out to the lion's den and spoke to a man who wasn't supposed to be alive anymore. But a voice came from the lion's den. O oh, king! You can't, we can't imagine. We can't imagine Doris's reaction when he heard that voice. It's likely he turned to his advisors, and if, if they were there, he might have gone by himself. But if anybody else was there, he probably turned to them and said, Did you hear that voice? Thinking that maybe he was hearing something. Just because of his own hope. And they opened the den, and there he was alive. And that changed everything. Changed everything because they hoped in God's kingdom. Things invisible. All these died in faith, the Apostle Paul wrote, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Now, brethren, we have a better view of them than they did. They saw them afar off. We've got a pretty clear view compared to theirs. A really clear view compared to theirs. Afar off assured of them, embraced them, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Powerful words. Powerful words. So, in conclusion, about hope and about learning, about patience and comfort, wishful thinking, theory, <laughs> Imagination, supposition, religious supposition. That's what some would call it. Subjective. You've just projected on all of these things what you want to see. And other people see, you know, how people reason about these things. That men have just generated religion of themselves, see? That's what the folks, the educated folk tell us. Well, they can go back and see how Religion has progressed down through the centuries from sacrifice of animals and humans to this and that, to spiritualizing everything, and oh, we can see it all together. The master affirmed the past record by his words and deeds. He spoke of Noah and David and Solomon. He even mentioned the Queen Sheba. These are real people. And our brother already mentioned Moses and Elijah appearing. There they stood talking. Now it was a pretty small group that saw and testified and Peter didn't have any physical relics of the experience, did he? Why, here's a rock that Moses stood on on the mountain. Here's a piece of Moses' robe that I was able to clip off while it come on. Their words... Their words were the testimony. Their words were the record. And it is the word of God 
written for our learning that gives us patience and comfort that we might have hope, a greater hope, a more sure hope, a more clear hope than these brethren who endured. Thank you, brethren. God's grace and peace.